Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Diaz. Thank you very much. My name is Tony Diaz, and rumors are true. I am a libro traficante. Now, as Senora Ramirez in Spanish told you, the word libro means book. Traficante, as Univision has shown you, means trafficker. The word's poetic, book trafficker. It's actually a pretty powerful term because it's ironic, it's interesting, but at some point it's got to dawn on you. It's 2013 and I've got to translate Libro Traficante into English because right now in the state of Arizona, Mexican American studies has been prohibited. It's hard to believe, it's dumbfounding, and the first time I heard about it, it infuriated us. However, we did something about it. So what I'm here to tell you about is how in this multicultural, multimedia era, we need the critical thinking that reading and writing inspire, and that's what ethnic studies is about. And the forces that want to step on our freedom of speech would prefer that we don't embrace each other. However, for us to thrive, that's exactly what we have to do. Let me tell you a little bit something about this law. Arizona House Bill 2281 prohibits courses that promote the overthrow of the government. Right? First of all, who worries about that? And second of all, how do you persecute a course? I know how you can hold someone at a trial and say, well, no, you've committed sedition. You are promoting the overthrow of the government, sir, ma'am. How do you take a course to trial? Well, let me tell you what they did in Arizona. To, to make that law work, administrators were forced to walk into classrooms during class time and in front of our young box of books by our most beloved authors. And if I have to explain to you how that is psychological warfare, how that is offensive, then you're on the wrong side of history. The other thing that's important about this is that it's the young people of Tucson who spoke out about this. The fact that most folks had not heard about this is very poignant because it's the youth in Tucson who stood up to the system and they're actually suing the state of Arizona. I'll be giving you more information about this as we talk, but we have to keep an eye on this. This is about everybody's freedom of speech. In spring of 2014, that case will go to the Ninth District. And I hope for all of us that they overturn this unfair, un-American law. Now, kind of, let me set up a little more about what was going on here. Um, some of these books, it had actually kindergarten through 12th grade, Mexican American Studies curriculum. They had stemmed the dropout rate. The graduation rate was 93%. This is what they took out of the classrooms. And there's about 80 books on this list. Let me tell you one of these dangerous books that's on there. House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Now, I'm like, OK, I better reread these books, because when I read House on Mango Street, Esperanza wasn't talking about overthrowing the government. <laughs> Maybe I read it too fast. <laughs> there were some red shoes in there. Maybe there's a subtle message <laughs> somehow. 
going through the list of books, it dawned on me that the oppressors in Arizona, they knew we would never overthrow the government through violence. They know that we'd overhaul the government by voting them out of office. And that's what they're scared of. I'll tell you what else they're scared of. If you look at the list of authors on that list, they're all like Sandra Cisneros. First of their family go to college, they succeed. She becomes a genius MacArthur Grant winner. Juno Diaz, first of his family go to college, writes books, goes on to win the Pulitzer Prize. Agoberto Gilb, first of his family go to college, goes on to write books, published in the New Yorker, Harper's, he started a center now called Centro Victoria at the University of Houston, Victoria. This is what they're scared of. And our response in Houston was to say, you know what? You're going to ban the books, you're going to smuggle them right back, Arizona. So me and my colleagues launched the Libro Traficante Caravan <laughs> to smuggle the banned books back into Arizona. And I know there's some folks that are still not keen on social media. We heard about this not through mainstream media. We heard about this by the youth on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, through blogs, websites, and then we started looking into it. I want the young people in the room to remember something too. Only art can save us. And there's a big tension right now. The world is changing rapidly, which you're accustomed to. There's some other folks that don't like that change and they're scared of it, and they're gonna try and put it off. It's important for all of us to fully embrace a multicultural, multimedia era for the good of this country, for the good of education. And I'm gonna give you some of the background into how we were able to organize this caravan. But I, I really have to explain why I'm so passionate about education. My parents were migrant workers. And in case you're not familiar with what that means, that means that if it were a weekday and also weekends, they would wake up 5 a.m., they would feed the kids, they would get in a truck, and they would drive to someone else's ranch, and they would pick someone else's crops. And some of the kids in the audience right now, you are the same age that my brothers and sisters, instead of going to school, would have to get in that truck, go to that field, and pick. At one point, my mother and father said, you know what, we have to get one of our kids to go to school. I'm that kid. Um, my brothers and sisters still resent that I never picked sometimes, right? Um, so I knew it was a blessing. I knew education was that important. I'm the first of nine to go to college to get a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, to write a book, and the power of education is that in one generation, my family's gone from the farm fields to where I have the privilege of representing my community on a national stage. We will not allow that to be denied to any of our young. And I do wanna get how Texas has responded to this. But I also want to preface some of what I'm saying. We've, we're very limited in how we talk about identity, race, some of these different issues, so that sometimes I want to explain our frustration. So those of us who organize in a community, we're on quantum physics when it comes to identity. Other folks are on basic math. So sometimes there's a little bit of frustration. So yes, I get it. Every Cinco de Mayo, when I'm the only Hispanic at a boardroom, I'll be asked the same questions. How come my Dominican friends aren't into Cinco de Mayo? How come 
come you're not wearing Cinco de Mayo wear? <laughs> and I'm thinking, didn't I answer this last year and the year before that? And people I know lovingly say, well, do you prefer to be called Latino, Hispanic, Chicano, Mexican, Mexicano, Mexican-American, Chicano, Texican, Chicano. <laughs> and my answer always is yes. There's a little bit of frustration too because I also know people want to sincerely know. And on the flip side, because of the limits of language, sometimes it's gonna sound as if I'm blaming certain folks. I'm not. I'm trying to use the words at our disposal to describe the situation we're in. And as a writer, I'm also trying to create other terms. Because I know a lot of times when people hear a, a Mexican American speaking and they speak well, they're like, you know what? That guy is really smart and cool for the Mexican Americans. And I know every Hispanic Heritage Month, we're having our events, people are like, you guys go have your events. Tell us how it is. And other times too, when we put on literary productions, we'll get calls from people. And they'll say, you know, I'm not Latino, can I go to your poetry reading? And it's so new, the metaphor I use, the analogy is that if someone's gonna go to an Italian restaurant, they don't call and say, hey, you know, I'm not Italian. Is it cool if I go to your restaurant? <laughs> My point is that it's very new, and these words are still evolving as we evolve as Americans. And sometimes people say, oh, no, you're talking about us. No, no, this is all of us. And sometimes it's me, sometimes it's you, sometimes it's all these things together. This struggle is everybody's struggle. Arizona Hospital 2021 did not specifically mention Mexican-Americans, but no doubt we were targeted by that. And if our community doesn't react, they will come for the next group. Then they will come for the next group. We had to take a stand. And it's been very hard to organize in the limitations of all these languages, but it's also been very beautiful. So I know I've depressed you, so let me, let me bring you up now. Because we have a lot to be proud of with our, with our young, what's going on. Um, so, Libro Traficante is just the tip of the pyramid. And I'm gonna be showing you some pictures from the whole different excursions that we've been on. And when I use the phrase, tip of the pyramid, I want you to know that it's because tip of the iceberg is a cliche. Also, whenever you hear an iceberg, people think of the Titanic, Leonardo DiCaprio, I gotta give Nick Leonardo DiCaprio. And what we really are about as writers is changing the way people think and speak so that we're using words and words don't use us. So the tip of the pyramid is Libro Traficante. And it was a wonderful experience. We did it back in March of 2012. It was a six-city caravan. People from across the country donated the band books. We started four underground libraries. And our goal was to hand those love letters from everybody in the US to the students of Tucson. And our underground libraries are still standing. We're spreading them. And now we've united to make sure that people know about this campaign. You can actually go to saveethnicstudies.org to find out how the youth are doing because they will be going to the 9th District. If that law is overturned, freedom of speech will prevail still in America. If it doesn't, we'll have to wait a few more years. More lives will be stressed, if not crushed. It will cost more money. And I still believe in America. I have no doubt that when that case should make it to the Supreme Court, it will be poetic justice when the lone Latina Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor signs the opinion overturning that un-American racist law, and we'll be dancing in the streets when that happens. And I know that America is still America, and the more people that hear about this know it's wrong, but people aren't hearing about this. 
Sometimes we feel helpless. People hear about this and they're like, well, what can we do? You know, these people are powerful. They're, they're politicians. When we started planning for the caravan, it was actually because of 14 years of hard work with Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. It's a group I founded, and we just started having poetry readings at the party hall of Chapultepec Restaurant. And I remember the first time we did it, people were like, no, Latinos don't like books. No, there's not enough Latino writers, no. And in fact, at our first event, they put out eight chairs. And I'm like, oh yeah, hombre, where are my chairs? Like, we tried something like this in the 80s, it didn't work. I'm like, get more chairs, it's working today. It was packed that day, and we never looked back. And in those 14 years, from the group that's considered to be dropouts, from the group that was thought not to be interested in books, we went on to create the biggest book fairs in Houston. We created a radio program that's still on the air. It's on 90.1 FM KPFT. Nuestra palabra, Latino writers having their say. Thank you very much. And we created these teams of organizers so that we had a relationship already with every single writer that was on the band book list. And then we started looking at I-10 and said, you know what? We know Sandra Cisneros in San Antonio. Like, wait a minute, Albuquerque's there. We know Rodolfo and Naya. And we started calling them. And they get mad. I remember we called Dagoberto Gilb. And we were going to put him on the radio show. And we said, Dagoberto, you're banned. He goes, what an honor. <laughs> I said, we're going to be smuggling books back. He goes, that sounds cool. <laughs> the writers started donating books, writing checks. I want to give a tip of my hat to the other four founders of Libro Traficante. It is Brian Paras, Diana Lopez, Lupe Mendez, and Laura Costa. But when we sit at the table, we don't play. It's like having five 10th degree black belts sit down. And we had the audacity and the knowledge to do this because we had basically said, you know what, we're not dropouts. Let's create a huge book fair. You know what, our people are interested in radio shows. Let's do one. So when we sat down, we started connecting all the folks along the I-10 route. And they started jumping on board and saying, we want to help. This is important. The other thing that's key is that it was all social media to begin with. It got reported like that first. And then it went to mainstream media. But it's these little devices, this is not one, pretend it is, that convey this information that mainstream media is not, is not reporting. The other thing that's important for the young to, to understand is it's more vital now for critical thinking to write well because the rules have changed. I, I talk to teachers all the time and they say, you know, these young kids, they don't like to read or write. Pretending I smoke a lot. Right? I said, well, I don't know. Have you read their blogs? What's a blog? I don't know, some of them have tweeted a novel, pretty much, if you add up all the tweets. I think they're writing. No, they're not writing. The rules have changed. And you're in this interesting dynamic. But we need you. It's being determined right now. So. As Texas looks at Arizona, it's very easy for us to say, well, that can never happen in Texas. Well, it can't. We've never had Mexican American studies kindergarten to 12th grade. There's nothing to prohibit. On the other hand, at this moment, we are on the verge of embracing our culture. And this is the interesting dichotomy. As Arizona bans us to its own demise, Texas is set to embrace it. And as you're studying literature, as you're studying history, take a look at the Renaissance. There has to be a decay, a decadence, before there's a Renaissance. And 
To me, a society will be judged by its laws. That should be the highest expression of logic. That should be what they're worried about to go down to history. And that is a decay in Arizona. They've lost that fight. They will suffer from that. On the other hand, Texas is poised to spread ethnic studies. We have another website, mastexas.org. And I'm hoping that in one year we can report to you that ethnic studies has been in included in all the curriculums in Texas, as well as other ethnic studies as well. And this is important for us to understand that this is the only way that we can survive in a multicultural, multimedia era. So I really thank you for giving me a chance to, to talk to you. And it is an honor and blessing to convene with you on the eve of a renaissance where all of us together will usher in the American dream for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Got a standing ovation.